So I believe that all children should have equitable access to high quality music education and to be able to use the musical process to help them develop the character, the skills, and all of the sensibilities that they will need to be a contributing member of society, a contributing member in their community, at home, and in the classroom. I know that playing in an orchestra is the best thing that young people can spend their time on. And I know this because I lived it, I continue to live it, and I have the opportunity to watch hundreds of the most beautiful kids in Philadelphia succeed from going through that process every single day. My inspiration comes from the example that my parents have set for me, what they have taught me directly and indirectly. My father grew up in the early 40s in Jackson, Mississippi, would then go on to go to high school, be the only one of his 11 siblings to graduate, serve honorably in the Vietnam War, utilize the GI Bill to get his bachelor's, and then a master's in music performance. My mother grew up on the south side of Chicago in the mid-50s, lost her father when she was young, and her mother did everything that she could to provide the very best for her and her sister. And through the process of music, she was able to be one of seven kids who helped to integrate the Chicago public schools. And at times, when there were thousands in the community saying, by you being here, you will lessen the quality of education that my own kid will receive, and to watch them move out of the community, she pushed through all of the insults from the crowd, even the kids cheering the year that Martin Luther King was assassinated. And finishing a bachelor's in music, and then going to earn a master's in business administration from Indiana University, where she met my father. Now, they decided to settle in Atlanta. They had a big family. I have seven siblings. But we all had to play music. Now, the joke in our house always was that you only ate on the days that you practice. <laughs> so four of us decided to become professional musicians. The other four decided to become normal. <laughs> and, uh, but it was one thing that was extremely important for my own development, considering all of the challenges that my family went through. So the first time I played in an orchestra, I was 10 years old. This was not my elementary school orchestra. This was me with a bunch of high school kids. It's the scariest thing I've ever done. My mom even had to sit with me and help me count my rest and rhythms so that I wouldn't mess up and stay on track. But I really loved it. See, in this orchestra, there's 15 different instruments. We're all trying to play at the same time. And although me as a trumpet player, I could play louder than the entire group, it was my responsibility really to blend with everyone and for us to work together so we could best communicate the musical ideas of the composer. And through that uh, experience, um, I found a way to help myself, to be motivated. I wanted the whole group to sound good. Now, I wouldn't need my mom's help after that first year counting the rest and rhythms, but I would rely on her support as I became serious. Two years later, I found myself here in Traverse City, right down the road at the Interlochen Arts Camp. And there, summer after summer, I was able to broaden my horizons of the other students that I was in a cabin with, all the way to the different ensembles that I was able to play in. And that glue for the other 10 months of the year when I went back home helped me to continue to achieve more. So it was all of my musical mentors here in the summertime, back home in Atlanta during the year, that helped me to prepare to enter the most selective college in America, the Curtis Institute of Music, a school that only has 175 students but all attend tuition-free. So these are tough spots to get. 
probably about 3% of applicants they accept. So at this place, I was able to play the staples of the orchestral and opera repertoire, chamber music, with world-class conductors and soloists, and of course, my own colleagues each week. But it was in that process of trying to become the best musician that I really lost touch with wh why I was in music in the first place. So in my last semester of college, Dr. Jose Antonio Abreu, who founded the music education and social development program of Venezuela called El Sistema, he won the TED Prize. And in his speech, he talked about just about everything that I had experienced, how important it is to provide the very best musical experiences so that young people can grow, not for a product of becoming a professional musician, telling the world how good you are, and hoping that people come to your concerts. So a year after watching that speech, I found myself in his office in Venezuela, preparing for a two-month tour of his programs throughout the country. And he said something that struck a chord really deep inside by saying that culture for the poor should not be a poor culture. That was the guiding philosophy of my childhood, and that would then become the guiding philosophy of Play on Philly. So when I went back to Philadelphia, I started looking through a completely different lens and started to tell myself, if parents want the very best for their kids, which I'm convinced all of them want that, and if kids are curious to learn, and if teachers are passionate about teaching, why can't we do a better job? So I started to think about, well, what are the real obstacles to success for these young people that, are, of course, are trying to go through life like all of us have been able to? So I think about stress, the toxic stress these kids are under, when dad doesn't live there anymore, when you are taking care of your little sister, mom works two, maybe even three jobs. Sometimes you don't eat a good meal on the weekends, or maybe most nights you don't. You watch violence happen all throughout your neighborhood. Immediate family members are affected, friends are affected. It happens sometimes right in front of your doorstep. And you think these kids are gonna come to school and just be ready to be filled with science and math and more reading? I also think about the young people avoiding high-risk behaviors. And when you think the world has nothing to offer you and you have nothing to offer the world, then why, why try? Just make the decision, even if you're well aware of the consequences. When I think about the lack of quality after-school activities, even kids not going to school, parents, families not really being involved in their kids' education, these are all obstacles that make it very difficult for kids to really thrive. So I also started to think about, well, considering my own experience, considering what my parents went through, how can we use this tool of music to really help young people in a really profound way? How can we begin to break down those barriers that create the obstacles that our kids are facing? So, I think about executive functioning skills. This is your ability to set a long-term goal and then achieve all of the small steps that it takes to accomplish it. And when I think about in a musical context, when you tell a kid, memorize all your scales, remember where to put your fingers or what combination of buttons to press, you help to build their memory. When you're telling the kids to perfect your technique by moving the angle of the bow just slightly, will improve your sound. That's really what helps build their level of focus. And then, when you're also asking kids, observe the rest. Don't play for a couple of seconds, and then continue to play. You help them to build inhibition, the ability for them to control their impulses. And then when a kid is sitting in the context of an orchestra, they're trying to figure out where to put their fingers and what to do with their bow, and how long to hold whatever note they're supposed to be playing, 
at the same time they're listening to their neighbors, if they're in tune with them, if they're playing the same rhythms, if they're in the same spot, while watching the conductor telling you to slow down slightly, or we're gonna hold that note just a little bit longer before we continue to play, you help to keep the amount of attention in a young person flexible so that they can do all of these various tasks. So by building out all of these executive functioning skills, that's what helps the kid go back into the classroom and focus for a little bit longer, or remember those steps to that problem so that they can repeat the steps and do their homework. I also think about how we can not only teach these executive functioning skills, but all the pro-social behaviors that are healthy. So when the kids are learning in a group and they're struggling together to sound better, then you help them build out the relationships that they really need to be successful later on, which is different than putting 10 kids on a basketball court and they have to compete and half of them always have to lose. So if they can learn to win together, it helps build a level of pro-social skills that we know is important. Getting the parents back involved. When a parent sees that their curious kid can actually achieve something, that the kid is being recognized in a positive way and not what they see on the news in the evening, then it helps to build a much stronger bond between the child and the parent when they really believe that their kid can do something special. Maybe it's music in middle school and high school, and maybe it's engineering in college, but that bond and creating that at an early age is extremely important. So as we look at this, we then say, okay, how can we build a comprehensive program that helps to build all of these things? So at Play on Philly, what we do with the students that we work with is that we build strong partnerships with the school. If we can put a kid in an environment from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. where everybody's holding the bar high for them and helping them to succeed, and even when they fall on their face, help to pick them back immediately and have them go through the process again, then that helps a, a kid to really stay in an environment where there's, there's success in their day from the beginning to the end. We also train professional musicians that, that want to be active in the community, but train them to be effective in the classroom and to make sure that they can engage the kids at a level where we know these kids can uh, succeed musically. We also think about getting the parents back involved as ushers at concerts, as volunteers, those that help on the various trips when the kids perform all throughout the region in the Northeast and making sure that they are part of uh, success. And we provide everything to our students, tuition, instruments, supplies at no cost, while making sure we engage them for three hours every day after school throughout the school year and six weeks in the summer. So 600 hours of quality music education delivered each year to each student. We know that we can make a difference. So as I think about what our kids are capable of doing. I go back to that one sentence that Dr. Abreu said, culture for the poor should not and it cannot be a poor culture. So what I want to leave you with today is this image of the play on Philly Symphony Orchestra. They are playing in Verizon Hall in Philadelphia, one of the finest concert halls in the world. And standing in front of them is the music director of the Berlin Philharmonic, Sir Simon Rattle. Now, I've rehearsed with Maestro Rattle several times. I've never performed with him, let alone perform for a sold out audience in Verizon Hall. So as I watch the kids take the stage and play their hearts out with Maestro Rattle, I was thinking, you know, Play on Philly is a program that's not only giving these kids what I received, they're giving them a lot of stuff I've never had the opportunity to even accomplish. So culture for the poor should not and it cannot be a poor culture. So that means that we all have the responsibility of providing the best instruments to the poorest kids, that we provide the best teachers to the most vulnerable kids, 
and that we work really hard to provide the best musical experiences to the most marginalized kids. And like my mom did with me, we need to sit next to every single one of these kids and help them count their rests and rhythms until they get it. Thank you.